Amen. We'll be in Colossians 3.13 today. We'll also be, for those that like to follow along with your copy of the Word, we'll also be in Matthew 18. Colossians 3.13, we'll be there just for a second, and we'll mainly be in Matthew 18. For those of you that like to take notes, I haven't put that up there in a while, but you can go to fbcdan.com slash notes, and you can follow along with my notes. You can email those to you when you're done. You can email those to you right now if you want to, but you can also take notes on the website with that. It's built into the system. It will email both to you when you get finished. So you can use that QR code or fbcdan.com slash notes. We'll get you there. Do that. We are in the third week of a four-week series. We'll finish it next week. A reminder again, if you weren't in here yet, we will have traditional service next week. Traditional service next week. So if you feel like dressing up, dress up. We'll sing hymns, and we'll, uh, we'll just enjoy uh, celebrating, uh, celebrating that traditional service. So um, that is next week. So perseverance of the saints, blessed trinity. Last week, this week is forgiveness that is unending. And next week, we'll finish with the provision that is bountiful. Again, We'll be in Colossians today, Matthew 18 also. So, what's forgiveness like? I think this says it well. Forgiveness is like this. To live above with saints we love will certainly be glory. To live below with saints we know, well, that's another story. I don't know about you, but sometimes I don't feel like forgiving. There you go. There's your honest statement. Sometimes I don't feel like forgiving. I had something stolen from me this week. I don't want to forgive that person for doing that. I want to hurt them. I want to put my hands on them. That's what I want to do. But it's not the way I should be, but it's the way I am, unfortunately, sometimes. That's the way it is, right? To live with each other, it's, it's not easy. You know, there's a, there's a saying that goes through ministry all the time, and it's usually coming from a pastor that's worn out and about to check out, and, and you know, you hear things like, you know, ministry would be easy if it weren't for the people, you know, stuff like that. We're, it's difficult. We're difficult. Sin is difficult. Forgiveness is difficult. Living to the calling, the high standard in which we've been called to is difficult. That's also what makes it special. But it's not easy. I'll be the first one to say that. So before we get into anything else today, I struggle to forgive all the time also. Okay? So I'm not pointing fingers today. But here's our main verse for today as we get into that. Our first verse. Therefore, God's chosen ones, holy and love, put on heartfelt compassion... Kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Verse 13, accepting one another and forgiving one another if anyone has a complaint against another. Just as the Lord has forgiven you, so you must also forgive. This is Paul's letter to the church at Colossae. And and Paul has this list, these lists like this, in several places in his letters. Because they needed reminding of it. And that's why it's in God's Word. Because we need reminding of it. But this isn't the only place. You could go... All over scripture, and you're going to find forgiveness and the subject of forgiveness. Luke 6, 37. Judge not, and you will not be judged. Condemn not, and you will not be condemned. Forgive, and you will be forgiven. Or you can go to Mark eleven twenty five, And whenever you stand praying, forgive. If you have anything against anyone, so that your Father also who is in heaven may forgive you your trespasses. Think about that. Jesus says, if you're praying to God the Father and you realize there's something you need to forgive someone for, handle that first before praying to him. God takes this forgiveness thing pretty seriously. Ephesians 4.32, you all know this is one of my favorite verses. Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another as God in Christ forgave you. That's Paul right there also. Here's you, here's you a visual Okay, here's your visual. A hundred and about 127, about 130 times, 127 times this word forgiveness is used all throughout Scripture. That's from the start to the finish. Those red dots are every time that it's in the word. This is something that we are supposed to do. There is no doubt as a person following Jesus, as a member of his body, a member of his church, we are to be forgiving people. We should be known by forgiveness. We should be characterized by forgiveness. We should be practiced at it, and we should be good at it. We are to be known by forgiveness. There's our verse again for today. So, as I've already got up here and admitted to you, if we're supposed to be good at it and known by it and do it well, then why aren't we? (laughs) 
<laughs> Why aren't we good at it? What, what do we need to do to be better forgivers? What is the standard for forgiveness? What is God's standard for forgiveness? And what are the requirements? Does this mean I have to just get dumped on my whole life? Is that what you're saying? How, do, how does forgiveness affect my life? So when you approach Scripture, approach, approach things that you struggle with with questions and then see what the Lord can do with those questions. Will it make a difference? Will forgiveness, come on, preacher, is it really going to make a difference in my life? Like, come on, is this really going to matter? Does it really make a difference? Is there a presence or lack thereof of, or forgiveness? Is that really going to make a difference in my life? Well, I'm glad you asked. I'm glad you're so inquisitive this morning. <laughs> I'm glad you asked these lovely questions. I believe God's Word has something to say to us this morning about this subject. Now, this past week before last, uh, me and several other men, we spent uh, a few days down in Dallas, Carrollton, Texas, actually, but the DFW area, at a conference. And uh, we got to hear some of the best preachers in the country deliver some of the most powerful and dy dynamic messages I've ever heard. It was incredible. It's always incredible. But we were able to hear, finally, I've, I've wanted to hear this man in person for a long time. We were able to hear Tony Evans. I've always wanted to hear Tony Evans speak in person uh, for a long time, and we were able to hear him. He's someone that I've admired. Uh, he's someone that inspires me. Um, and it was very inspiring to hear him. He's a very good preacher, and it was really good. In his message, he articulated something that preachers know is the formula and that many congregants across the nation and the world come to pastors for this formula. When something goes wrong in your life, you come to the pastor and you say, help. And you expect the pastor to have a formula. For some reason, we, we drift away from this at times, but, but when we need it most, we tend to come back to it. Here's what Tony said. Tony said, if you come to me and you're having trouble in your marriage, not a very uncommon thing that happens fairly often. You come to me and you say, I'm having trouble with my marriage, and you ask me what to do. This is Tony Evans speaking. I'm going to identify the areas of concern in your marriage, find the biblical principles that deal with these concerns, attempt to give practical steps to apply those biblical principles to the area of concern, and I'm going to pray for the Holy Spirit to bless you in your obedience. He said, now, if you come to me and you're concerned about your job, I'm going to identify the areas of concern with your job. I'm going to find the biblical principles that deal with those concerns. Attempt to give practical steps to apply those biblical principles to an area of concern and pray for the Holy Spirit to bless your obedience. Notice the trend. Notice the formula. Well, you say, we're supposed to be forgiving people. Well, let's look at what God's Word says. Let's see what the biblical principles are. Let's try to practically apply those to our life and see what happens when the Holy Spirit blesses our obedience? And he went on and on and on through several different things. And he said it about seven or eight different times. And, you know, you start laughing by the end of it. Because it really is that simple. It's also that hard. But it really is that simple. I believe God has something for us today. If God designed it, then God has the right to give the directions on how to use it. And that's, that's, that's why we're looking at God's Word. So, I, I and I hope you... But I know I am thankful for unending forgiveness, and we're going to dig into that today. So as we get to Matthew 18, hopefully you're there also. Matthew 18, verse 21. Then Peter came to him and said. Then Peter came to him and said. Oh, Peter. I just, I just love Peter. I mean, I love him. I love this guy. Speaking before he thinks, saying what everybody else is thinking. Try, trying to bust out there and spread those peacock feathers and really impress the Lord and impress somebody. I mean, he just, he's just hard charging. And most of the time, he's charging right into a brick wall. But he's trying to do something, right? That's Peter. I love this guy. We, one of the other pa pa pastors we heard speak, he talked about how Peter, James, and John, you know, Jesus is always bringing them along. And people think it's because they were special or his favorite. He said, I don't think that's what it is. I think they were the three biggest knuckleheads in the group. So he had to keep them as close to him as possible to try to make a difference in their life. But here's Peter, right? And Matthew in this section, this, this section of, of Matthew's letter, uh, it's, it's telling what Jesus had to say about good, healthy relationships. That's pretty much what chapter 18 is about. Most of it is quoting Jesus. 
And he gives three tenets in this chapter, three things that go with healthy relationships. You have to have humility. You have to have honesty. You have to be humble. You have to be honest. And then here in this section that we're looking at today is the importance of forgiveness and what that looks like. So then Peter says, Lord, how many times could my brother sin against me and I forgive him? As many as seven times. Now this section we're in, God has just explained how to handle church discipline. Okay, One of the most overlooked sections of scripture probably in the modern church. When someone sins, how do you handle that? When someone hurts you, how do you handle that? When somebody in the church, a professing follower of Jesus, a Christian, when they mess it up, when they hurt you, when they wrong you, how do you properly handle that? You can go back and read that. It's there. It's plain and simple. And so Peter steps up and he says, hey, well, in that case, how many times I got to forgive, old boy? Right? How many times I got to forgive this guy? And you read that and you say, well, What's Peter saying here? I just wonder when you hear that, are you impressed or are you like seven times? Before you pass judgment on what Peter says here, here's the thing. The traditional teachings of the rabbi at the time was that on a specific offense, you only had to forgive it up to three times. So this guy does this to you, you forgive it. This guy does it to you, you forgive it. He does the same thing again, you forgive it. After the third time, it's up to you. You're good. Fourth time, you don't have to forgive it. And and I, I don't know about you, but... Some of you are probably thinking this morning, hey, that doesn't sound too bad. <laughs> right? <laughs> that, I mean, that doesn't sound too bad. Right? You got knuckleheads that are consistently doing knucklehead stuff. It's hard. So Peter, being Peter, he walks up to the Lord and he sticks out his chest and he says, Lord, how many times I got to forgive him? Up to Seven? I mean, he's get, it's more than twice what was already expected, right? The tradition was three. He says seven. So it, it's a lot. And I don't know if you've ever forgiven somebody something major seven times for the same offense, but that wouldn't be easy. But we read that and we go, come on, Peter, because we know what Jesus says right after that. But we forget that Peter was just a human being struggling with the same things we struggle with. But here's what happens after he says that. This is Jesus talking now, verse 22. I tell you, not as many as seven, Jesus said to him, but 70 times seven. For this reason, the kingdom of heaven can be compared to a king who wanted to settle accounts with his slave. When he began to settle accounts, one who owed 10,000 talents was brought before him since he had no way to pay it back. We're going all the way to 35. His master commanded that he, his wife, his children, and everything he had Uh, Everything he had be sold to pay the debt. At this, the slave fell down, face down before him, and said, Be patient with me. I'll pay you everything. Then the master of the slave had compassion, released him, and forgave him the loan. Verse 28. But that slave went out and found one of his fellow slaves who owed him 100 denarii. He grabbed him, started choking him, and said, Pay what you owe. At this, his fellow slave fell down and began begging him, be patient with me, and I will pay you back. But he wasn't willing. On the contrary, he went and threw him into prison until he could pay what was owed. When the other slaves saw what had taken place, they were deeply distressed and went and reported it to their master, everything that had happened. Then, after he had summoned him, his master said to him, you wicked slave, I forgave you all that debt because you begged me. Shouldn't you also have had mercy on your fellow slave as I had mercy on you? And his master got up angry and handed him over to the jailers to be tortured until he could pay everything that was owed. So my heavenly father will also do to you if each of you does not forgive his brother from his heart. Father, please speak to me today. Change my heart. Change me for good, Lord. Change me for your name. Speak in me and through me, Lord. Use your word to accomplish what only your word can accomplish. We pray it in Jesus' name this morning. Amen. All right, so let's dig through this and go through it and then see how it applies to us. Verse 22. I tell you, Jesus answering Peter, right? Now, Peter has offered more than double what's traditionally expected. He's got his chest out and his chin up. Lord, how many times should I forgive? Seven? And Jesus says, no, man. Way more than that. 
70 times seven. It's a huge number. It's a huge number. And when Peter heard that, he had to been he had to have been thinking what you and I would think if someone who was hurting someone you loved, and then someone else came up and said, yeah, they're going to do that 490 more times. And you got to forgive them 490 more times. It might, he might as well say a billion. He might as well say a, mil, a number you can't even think of. I had a funny video to show you all for this this morning, but I actually forgot. Jessica and Josh are laughing. But I actually forgot to put it in the computer, and, I, and I'm so mad at myself for forgetting. Um, but I don't want to chase that rabbit. So, <laughs> And then Peter says, uh, Jesus says, no, 70 times 7, Peter. It, it's, it's like this. And then he goes into a parable like he normally does. He goes into this parable, and he's teaching to make a timeless point. This point applied then, and it will always apply. This parable, this story is a timeless truth that Jesus gives. He says, hey, it's like this. The boss calls up his employees to settle their debts, right? We hear slave, we think 18th century slavery. That's not the way it was. You, that was the only way you could make a living if you weren't already somebody. If you were a nobody, you had to just sell yourself as an employee. That's what this word means. He says, hey, he calls him up, time to pay the debts you owe me. And this one guy has a lot, and I mean a lot of debt to pay back the master. We'll get into how much shortly, specifically here in a minute. But he says, this guy owes a lot, and the boss is going to take everything from him because of this huge debt. But the employee appeals to the kindness and compassion of the boss. He says, please, please, I'll do whatever I have to do. I'll pay it back. Just don't take away my wife, my kids, my whole life. Don't take it away. And the boss has compassion, right? The boss says, hey, your debt's forgiven. This humongous, astronomical, hard-to-understand debt, it's forgiven. And he releases him to freedom. Now, this same knucklehead, that's my translation, this same dude that just got forgiven this mountain of financial debt that he owed to his, to his master, to his, to his boss, goes out after experiencing this miracle of debt forgiveness from his boss. And he turns around, and he won't give the same compassion. And forgiveness to a fellow slave laborer over some piddly, piddly change. Not, not only will he not forgive his debt, but he gets physical with him. Did you catch that in there when we read through that? He gets physical. He grabs the guy by his throat and starts choking him like this. Pay what you owe, he says to him. The guy starts begging him. Please, please be patient. Be patient. Be patient with me. I'll pay it back. I'll pay it back. I promise I'll pay it back. This dude says no. Has him thrown into debtor's prison to pay off this debt. To that I say, what a hypocritical jerk. I mean, you read the story and that guy comes across like a humongous jerk. Dark, dark heart. Sinner. What a sinner that guy is. And check this out. After Jesus has told this parable, listen to the result. The master learns of this, and he says to the employee, You wicked slave. You wicked, wicked slave. I forgave you all that debt because you begged me. Shouldn't you also have had mercy on your fellow slave as I had mercy on you? Wouldn't, wouldn't it make sense for you to repay the kindness and compassion shown you? That only makes logical sense. Isn't, isn't it obviously the morally right thing for you to do to pay forward the kindness and compassion been shown to you? Shouldn't you pay that forward? Isn't that that? That just makes sense for you to do that, to just pay that forward. It's the only right thing for you to do to forgive him considering how much I have forgiven you, the master says, says to the slave. Keeps going. And his master got angry. And handed him over to the jailers to be tortured until he could pay everything that was owed. So what does that mean? Now the master gives this wicked man exactly what he deserves. He ran up the debt. You should pay back a debt. I don't know if, if, if we all know that, young folks. If you, if you have a debt, you should pay back the debt. That's the way debts work. That's justice. You owe money, you pay money back. Right? And so he receives a just punishment. 
for the terrible proof shown of his wicked, wicked heart. And catch this last statement, verse 25, if you didn't catch it the first time. So my heavenly Father will also do to you if each of you does not forgive his brother from his heart. Now we've gone from just moral living and consequences here on earth to eternal application. Jesus says, this is how the Father conducts business. Humble your heart before me. Let me transform you into something holy, something new, or receive the just punishment that your evil, wicked heart deserves. God's not mean. That's justice. You do something wrong, you get punished. That's justice. He says, hey, you want a justice for old boy? Now you're going to get justice for yourself, too, since you're so interested in justice. But, but he says, I'm willing to forgive to the nth degree. I'm willing to forgive to a level that is hard for you to even fathom, much less understand. Let's look at some numbers. Okay, You guys know I'm a, I'm a nerd. I like numbers and stuff like that. Check this out. Back to verse 28. But the slave went out and found one of his fellow slaves who owed him 100 denarii. Okay? Now, how much are we talking here? A denarius was a Roman silver coin. It was the lowest form of currency. It would be like our penny would be the, be the equivalent. It's like a, it's like a penny. It's what a, it's what a laborer could expect to make in a day. Okay? So if you were a slave laborer, the, this, this, this the regular old working Joe... This is what you could expect to make for, for a normal job. So think of this as like minimum wage. Okay, This is minimum wage. So this worker owed the other worker 100 days worth of work in money. Okay, 100 denarius, 100 days worth of money. 100 days worth of wages. So, wages. so if we did some rough math, okay, this isn't exact, but if we did some rough math. In today's term, if you took a $15 minimum wage and an eight-hour day, that's $120 in a day if I didn't mess that math up. So this guy, if he made $120 a day in today's money, owed this guy roughly $12,000. Okay? Now, I don't know about you, but that's still a pretty decent debt. <laughs> I mean, I don't want to owe somebody $12,000, but it's not an impossible debt. I mean, if I owed you $12,000, it'd take a little bit, but I, I could pay that back. I could pay that back. It'd take some time, but I could pay that back. 100 days worth of wages, okay? Then you go back to verse 24. When he began to settle accounts, one who owed him 10,000 talents was brought before him. Now, two things right here. The talent is the complete opposite of the denarius. The, the denarius is like the penny. The, the talent is like the largest dollar bill you could have. They didn't have dollar bills, but it'd be like that. It's the largest unit of currency in the Roman world at the time. And 10,000 was the largest number you could express in ancient Greek. You couldn't say a larger number. So he, literally, Jesus says in this parable, this guy owes the largest currency to the biggest number that he could possibly owe. A day laborer would have to work 20 years to earn one talent. One talent. 20 years worth of work to earn one talent by, by their standards in that day. So it's like he's saying, you owe me 200,000 years worth of wages. That's how in debt this guy was. 10,000 talents was like saying, you owe me 200,000, not days, years worth of wages. It's an absolutely impossible debt to pay back on his own. The servant said to the king, have pity on me, Lord. I'll pay you back everything. There's no way. There's, there's no way this guy could pay back this debt. This statement shows that he doesn't get it. The slave doesn't get it. He doesn't get it. He hasn't repented. He, he doesn't realize what he's up against. He does not understand what is owed. And neither do most people who say they trust Jesus as their Lord and Savior. 
Neither do most people who, who have said those words. They don't understand what has been forgiven. They, they, say, they say they have asked him to forgive them of their sin. Do you realize what you have been forgiven? This is, this is what we look like when we try and please the Lord and reach the Lord with our self-righteousness. It's like paying back a denarius a day when you owe 10,000 talents. It's an impossible debt. You couldn't pay it back in 200,000 years worth of daily good deeds. As if that were even possible. It's an impossible debt. Our sin is an impossible debt to self-righteously pay back. You cannot do it. You can't. Let's put it in today's terms. Okay? If you put this in today's money, here's what it would be kind of like. So if it was $12,000 for the first slave, what the other guy owed back to the master was like $8,760,000,000. But he could only earn $120 a day. The guy could only earn $120 a day, but he owed $8.76 billion and had the audacity to stand in front of the king and say, I'll pay it back. What did the king do? He forgave it anyway. <laughs> he forgave it anyway. Unbelievable. When you really catch that, think about it. But church, person out there <laughs> listening on the cameras, I know we have many today, many sick. We miss you and love you. You can't pay it back. You can't pay it back on your own. He just didn't get what had been done for him. He didn't get it. And then he goes out and asks Look at those numbers and think about it. He's just been given, this dude is $8.76 billion richer than he was five seconds ago, and then goes and chokes a dude out asking for 12 grand. $12,000. What is he thinking? So the king finds out about it. He says, Hey, you want justice, do you? Okay. You can have justice if you want it. The other man, he's paying off his $12,000 debt to you in prison right now. So now, how about I throw you in prison so you can pay back to me what you owe me since you want justice? Because what we say, son, we just want things to be fair. No, you don't. We don't want things to be fair. If things were fair between us and God, no chance. You should be thankful and, and asking for grace and mercy because without those two things, we have no shot, no shot whatsoever. He says, you want justice? All right, you can get justice. So he gets what he wants. He wanted it. He wanted his 12,000. King says, all right, I'll take my 8.76 billion back out of you. Some, com some commentators say that 10,000 talents was such an astronomical expression that there was more money than was in circulation at the time total in the whole society. It was, it was equivalent then to about 750,000 pounds of gold. So he wants justice, he gets it. Verse 34. He wanted justice, he got it. Master got angry, handed him over to the jailers to be tortured until he could pay everything that was owed. This word jailer here, it's not a very nice word. It could be translated torturer. That's why I like the HCSB because it puts that in there because that's what it's implying. Handed him over to the jailers to be tortured until he could pay. This, this, this jailer, this, this torturer, this, this person, this is the person who, quote, unquote, from the dictionary, elicits the truth by use of the rack. An inquisitor. In other words, you're going to admit you've got a debt you can't pay back. Could be said that way. Catch this. In this verse. It takes an eternity to pay back an unpayable debt. It takes an eternity to pay back. Why, why would God allow that? To, because it takes an eternity to pay back an unpayable debt. And a just God will have debts paid. He will have debts paid. It takes an eternity to pay back an unpayable debt. And it takes a loving God to wipe away and forgive an unpayable debt. It's a God-sized debt. 
can only be paid back by God-sized action. And we know what that action was. We stand here and look at it every Sunday. That debt was paid right there on a wooden cross like that, on a place called Calvary, on a hill, where the Son of God shed His blood. Because without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sin. Jesus forgave that debt. Wanted to forgive that debt. Willingly went to the cross. Not just to bleed, humanly speaking, but to take the wrath of God the Father, the punishment for that debt, on him. He was tortured by the jailer <laughs> so that you didn't have to be. It's, un it's unfathomable how good God is. But remember the context of where we are here. Keep things in context, okay? The, the, he kind of goes eternal for a second, but the context of what he's talking about, Jesus is giving this parable as an example of how we should forgive each other our brothers and sisters in the church. That's the example of which this is being used. Jesus says here, there is no limit to forgiveness when repentance is present. That's key. But it's not your job to cause the repentance. It's your job to forgive. It's the per other person's job to repent. The king forgave even though he knew that the first slave hadn't actually repented. Gave him the opportunity, gave him the chance. So we should, be, we should be doing the same thing because God has and is doing the same thing for each of us. The, the Tyndale Commentary says it like this. If the church is the community of the forgiven, if the church is the community of the forgiven, then all its relationships will be marked by a forgiveness which is not a mere form of words but an essential characteristics. It, it, should, be, it should be stamped on our foreheads. We should be known as a forgiving people. If we're not, then you don't understand what Jesus did for you. You don't get it. You, you, you're like the first dude, the knucklehead. Verse 35, this is how we were heavenly father will treat each of us unless you forgive your brother or sister from your heart. Forgiveness, church, hear this, please hear this. Forgiveness is from the heart. It's not a spoken word. Although in many cases, in most cases, it should be a spoken word. There should be words spoken about forgiveness. But true forgiveness, real forgiveness, is from the inside. It's not forgiveness, but I still hate you. That's just some words. It's not forgiveness, but I want you to get punished. That's not forgiveness. It's not forgiveness, but I secretly want something bad to happen to you. That's not forgiveness. That's just some words that you said to make yourself feel better. That's not forgiveness. Forgiveness is from the heart. So, quick application. A few things. You're going to love this part. Because I can tell you've loved this first part so much, you're really going to love this part. I can tell. I'm going to go through a couple of words here. This is the first one. Some of us here this morning, maybe one person or a group, this is where you fall into when it comes to forgiveness. Self-righteous. If you can't forgive, then you don't understand what you have been forgiven. And you aren't who Jesus came for. Because you don't think you need forgiveness. Jesus said the healthy don't need a doctor. But Jesus, Jesus came to heal those who know they need healing. That's what he said. Self-righteousness is this. You have your outward game. What we can see, you've got it pretty much together. For the most part, your visible behavior that everybody can see is pretty good. It's pretty good. And you, and, and you feel pretty good about it. Everybody sees what you do, and they say, that's a pretty good dude. And you feel pretty good about the fact that they think you're a pretty good dude. But what about that part of you that nobody can see? What, what about you on the inside? The, the part of you, think about this, please try to visualize this. The, the part of you that if we could take it out of you and make it into a video and put it up here on this screen for everybody to see, that part of you that you'd be mortified if that were up there for other people to know that that's really how you are on the inside. That part of you, Jesus will forgive you for that part of you. Also, he'll forgive 
your sinfulness in that part of you also. And when you come to a place that you, that you, that you look at your mountain of sin debt and you realize that Jesus has forgiven that, you're humbled. You're humbled. And instead of saying, God, I'll pay it back, I promise. $120 a day for the next 200,000 years. Instead of that, you say, God, I can't repay it. I have no hope unless you wipe it away, unless you forgive it. No chance. And you either get that or you don't. Here's the thing. When you come to him and say that, Jesus says, hey, I already did. I already did. I already forgave it. I took the torment. I took the punishment. In my sacrificial death, it's already been forgiven in my heart, Jesus says. I was just waiting on you. When you realize that, it changes you. It changes the way you see people and the way you treat people. When you catch yourself peering down your nose at others' mistakes and others' misfortune, the Holy Spirit will say to you, no, 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 buddy. No, 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 no. No, no, no. I don't think so. He convicts and he redirects your heart back to repentance, back to the freedom from sin debt you've been given. And humility is the only proper and just response to the God who can and did forgive you for that. So today, if that is you, if this is you right here, be humbled, repent, and turn to Jesus. Call out to him for forgiveness and receive it. But there's another group here today. Some of us, maybe one person, maybe a group, I don't know. Maybe just somebody's going to listen to this later on. You fall into this group. Condemnation. And you're living in condemnation. You're living in guilt. And you're living in judgment. And you're living in disapproval. And Jesus has, is, and always will live from a place of forgiveness. You have got to understand that. You've got to understand that about our God. Stop letting Satan convince you that you are the problem or that God disapproves of you. Stay humble? Yes. Repentant? Yes. Desire holiness to do better? Desire that? Yes, of course. But live in defeat? Live in anguish and judgment and disapproval? No. No. That's not where we live as followers of Jesus. Your heavenly father calls you his own. <laughs> he calls you a child. Now, your dad, or, your dad or mom or whoever it was, they may have scarred you to think that, that you have to earn love and, and acceptance. But perfect father God loves you and just wants you to trust him in that. So trust in his forgiveness this morning and tell Satan he can take a hike. He's the loser. For our former Lutherans in the group or those that just like Martin Luther, here's a good quote. I often laugh at Satan, and there's nothing that makes him so angry as when I attack him to his face and tell him that through God I am more than a match for him. That's good. Don't live in condemnation. If you've been forgiven, you've been forgiven. God doesn't forgive like we forgive. He forgives for real. One more group. This may be you this morning. I don't know. I'm starting to get hot. I'm fixing to preach. I'm just now getting warmed up. <clears throat> this may be you this morning. The definition of this is marked by resentment or cynicism. Bitter. Life has not or is not going the way you think it should. Matter of fact, Matter of fact, if you were God, if you were God, you'd change some things. And your life would be better. You've been hurt, or you've had loss. You've just not been given a fair chance. And you're tired of fighting from behind. I mean, you've made some mistakes. But so has everybody else. And they, and they seem to have rebounded from those mistakes or even have gotten away with those mistakes. But here you are. Your mistakes have cost you everything, you think. You're stuck 
and what you would consider a dead-end life. And you, if you were honest and transparent about it, you're just mad at God about it. And you're, and you're taking that anger that really is at God, and you're taking it out on your loved ones and on yourself because you're trying to hurt Him. Newsflash, we can't hurt God, but we can hurt those that love us the most in this world. You're only hurting yourself and those that love you the most, the most. Here's the opposite of bitter, sweet, content, genial, good, helping, kind, mild, nice, pleasant, wonderful. Now, if you're honest and you set aside, if you could just set aside that anger and that disappointment just for a second, just set it aside just for a second, which one of these lists do you want to be you? Bitter, harsh, sour, hard, rigid, severe, sharp, coarse, resentful, or sweet, content, genial, good, helping, kind, nice, pleasant, wonderful. Think about it for a second. Which one of those two do you want to be? There's one bridge to get you from the left side to the right side. One bridge. It's just that simple. That's how you get from that side to that side. Understand that God really is a forgiving God. He really does love you. He really does care for you. He really has created an eternal place called heaven where he wants you to spend it with him. And everything in this life is a vapor. But eternity is forever. Forgiveness is the bridge from where you are to where you need to be. When someone messes up in the church or when there's something that has happened to you and you you don't have all the information about what happened, don't jump to the most negative and heinous explanation seek to understand or realize it may not even be your business in the first place so just stop worrying about it but if there is wrong done church if there has been wrong done then forgive 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 don't jump to the most heinous conclusion and then be mad about it and then think you have the right to hang on to that because you don't not if you follow Jesus not if you realize what you've been forgiven you don't have the right Not only do you not have the right, it's going to turn you into that. And nobody wants to live there. Does that mean you have to spend Thanksgiving together? No. It does not. It means you give up the right to punish them. It means you give up the right to punish them because it was never your right in the first place. Never was. Last slide. So this morning, (laughs) I'm thankful for unending forgiveness because it makes eternal relationship possible. If God had a limit on his forgiveness, then we couldn't spend eternity with him. We couldn't. If he had a limit on the amount of debt he was willing to to forgive and let go, you and I would be done. But he doesn't. He doesn't. He doesn't. And because that, eternal relationship with him is possible. And the same thing is true on, on this earth between you and me and everyone else. Without forgiveness, relationships are impossible to have because you and the other are going to mess it up. We have to be willing to forgive. And when you are the wronger, the one that did the wronging, you got to be willing to repent, to admit it, so you can fix the relationship. I don't know where you fall this morning, but I know there's one answer. Jesus Christ. Maybe you need to spend some time praying to him this morning. Maybe you just need to sing to him. I don't know. We'll finish up in this last song. I'll hang around after we need to talk, whatever it may be. But be thankful this morning for unending forgiveness. I'm thankful for it, and I pray that you are too. Father God, thank you for today. Thank you for your love and your grace and your mercy. Thank you that you don't give up on us. God, you should have given up on me a long time ago. Thank you that you haven't, God. Give us the strength, the desire, the heart, the want to, to express that same thing to each other as brothers and sisters in Christ, Lord. May we be marked. May the world look at them and go, I don't understand it. I don't, I'm not even sure I want it. But those people know how to treat each other. They know how to treat each other, God. May we be marked by that. 
and we be known as a forgiving people, not because we found the strength. We can't find that strength, God, because we understand what you have done for us. And we want to spread the same thing in your name because it's the only proper response to what you've done for us. God, we pray it all in your name. Jesus, the Son of God, amen.